Inspired by our worship and noting that we have a quorum, I call our July State of Meeting to order. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we acknowledge the strife, violence, and angst of this season, giving thanks for the hope we are called to live into through Christ. We have gratitude for the saints of Oxford, whose hospitality invites us to incarnate the spirit of the beloved community as we gather to do the work of the church. May that spirit guide our discerning as we seek to be faithful in caring for our congregations and pastors, even in the midst of challenging conversations about compensation and benefits. May it provide for all our needs. Inspire us with the stories of how you're bringing forth good fruit through the ministries we celebrate, through the seeds we have planted together through our covenant fund. And as we hear Ruth's reflections on the state of the church as she brings the perspective she's gleaned from her time as co-moderator to bear for the benefit of this presbytery, may we find ourselves strengthened to carry the good news of your presence among us back to our congregations and communities. For we know that in your will, Prayerfully, by speaking that truth, we can be set free to encounter the grace of God that empowers us to experience a deeper love of God and neighbor. It is in that spirit I invite you to share in the reading of the land acknowledgement that should be shown up on the screen. And it is there. We recognize the land on which we gather, now known as the greater Philadelphia area, as the unceded homelands of the Lenape. We acknowledge that for all those whose ancestors arrived on these lands since, our opportunities for education, home, and vocation have come at the expense of these ancestors and the future generations of our indigenous siblings. As those who serve within the Presbyterian Church, we also acknowledge that we as a church have been both the benefit unheard and untold stories, and as a commitment to continue the process of dismantling the ongoing injustices and inequities present today. We commit to turning back from the silence and disinterest that allows harm to continue to our indigenous siblings, many of whom still live in the region today, such as the Nanticoke Lenape tribal nations, with whom we hope continue or with us in person we'll be able to vote in this meeting we're grateful for you joining us on our live stream today Lloyd good morning good morning my name is Lloyd Higgins and as most of you suspect I am a member of this congregation <laughs> The, the, the Oxford Presbyterian Church, now in its 158th year of faithful witness Amen. to the birth, ministry, death, and resurrection of a time coming here, we, we welcome you to this simple, simple building. You know, and simple buildings like ours do not have complications when you try to find restrooms. <laughs> For instance, on my left, both in the sanctuary and the facility below, are the women's restrooms. And on my right, out of the sanctuary, and as we impose, immerse ourselves in looking for a new pastor, time has flown so quickly. It's now a year since our beloved Reverend Ethelyn Taylor retired from this wonderful congregation. We seek your prayers. Our ministries and witness continues. Uh, we do have our committed deacons who are doing their work. I'll we'll give a shout out to our committee of ministry appointed moderator, mm -hmm. the Reverend Diane Fitch, who is sitting here with us. So we welcome you. We seek your prayers as we navigate this new season, and we hope that the comfort that we provide will be acceptable. God bless you and enjoy. Thank you. 
It's just that I'm insulation challenged, so. All right, friends, our first order of business is our approval of the docket, which is on page 19 in the meeting materials for this meeting. On behalf of the Collegium, I move it. The motion to approve the docket is before you, commissioners. It does not require a second as it comes from the Collegium. Any discussion? Uh, we received the names of the following elders who have joined the church triumphant after the printing of our meeting materials. So I would like to lift their names up now. Lois Heyerdahl, uh, passed on July 15th from the Jeffersonville congregation. And Gary uh, Koch, I believe his name is uh, pronounced K-O-C-H, uh, passed on July 6th from the Abington congregation. And also just yesterday we received congregation who has died and has not been acknowledged through uh, the stating in our minutes, please contact either me or Zach Allen in the Presbytery office so that their names may be recorded in our minutes. Oh, one other word, uh, moderator. You know, normally Cassie Heinz would be the contact person for you to uh, give uh, information such as that to the Presbytery. Cassie is on maternity leave. Uh, the following be seated as a corresponding member for this meeting, Edward, Reverend Edward Santana Grace from San Gabriel Presbytery was the only name that I received. Are there any other uh, minister members uh, not of this presbytery present at this meeting? If not, I move that Reverend Santana Grace be seated. The motion is to seat corresponding members. Is there a second? All in favor, please say welcome. Any of you to check out the videos introducing our new members can be found in the Presbytery Facebook and YouTube pages. We also want to acknowledge any minister members who might be attending our meeting for the first time since joining us. If so, please stand and let us know your name and where you are serving. Seeing none, at this time I'd like to acknowledge the names of first time elder commissioners we have on record as having attended Presbytery for the first time. And I've been handed those by the stated clerk. Hopefully I'll pronounce these right. Uh, Carol Savory from Swarthmore. Please stand if you are, yeah, she are here. Thank you, Carol. All right. So if you are a first time voting elder commissioner and I didn't call your name, please stand share your name and congregation using your outdoor voice. And when we break up at the end of the business meeting, please be here to come up and make sure the stated clerk has your name and congregation for the minutes. Do we have anyone else? Yes, please. Welcome. Anyone else? Do those materials. Also want to highlight several flyers that were either in your materials or on the literature table. The Board of Pensions uh, has an opportunity for minister members to learn more about the changes in our Board of Pensions plan. There was a flyer about that in your, in your meeting materials. Also, a meet and greet about our mission co-workers who will be here on August 7th, and a flyer introducing our expenditure that uh, I have it by 12.30. And we are also grateful for any invitations to host the Presbytery for our November meeting this year and for the 2025 meetings that are listed on the bottom of your docket. That concludes my report. Thank you, Stated Clerk. I now recognize Elder Contina Lee Lundy and Reverend Diane Jamison Fitch, co-moderators of the Commission on Ministry, to present their report. Presbytery. As you will see in the minimal ministerial compensation for 2025, in your meeting materials, COM has approved a 4% increase in minimal salary. We recognize our minimal effective salary is significantly beyond, excuse me, behind many of our neighboring presbyteries and denominations. We hope to be better aligned with our peers all pastors cover the pastor along with any needed family health coverage. Moving forward, the BOP are 
is only mandating coverage by our congregations for just their pastors. Any additional coverage for a spouse, children, or family can be added with the cost covered by the church, by the minister, or shared between the church and the minister. The COM approved and our collegium has concurred with the dues paid have been based upon the position, regardless of family status. It meant that churches, regardless of size or resources, communally share the responsibility of equitable health coverage. We continue to believe that terms of call should provide full family coverage paid for by the congregation. In order to reflect our values and maintain call neutrality, which is pastors cost the same regardless of family staff. At an increased due percentage. So what will this mean for our congregations in 2025? It means that no one loses the medical coverage that they need in 2025. It means that the 2024 terms of call total compensation becomes the starting point for 2025. The 2024 terms of call should not go down in 2025 because of a reduction in the Board of Pension dues. So in other words, the total bottom line cost of the church for pastoral leadership, including salary and benefits, will not lower in 2025 from what it is in 2024. For pastoral leaders who do not require family coverage, the reduced cost in the Board of Pensions dues should be allocated somewhere else in their compensation, such as salary, 403B, study leave, or a combination of those. The Presbytery will continue to explore ways to come alongside our churches. And the COM is committed to serving as covenant partners with Presbytery leadership and are happy to engage in conversation with churches who need to consider their options in light of these changes. We present these changes seeking to uphold our Presbytery's value of caring for our pastors and congregations, regardless of size or resources. Please be in touch with your COM liaison or regional moderator if you have any questions or concerns. The, excuse me, the Presbytery of Philadelphia welcomes conversation of the nurses button there on the home page to find a video presentation from COM Chair, the Reverend Carrie Olson. You are also encouraged to re reach out to our church consultant for our region, the Reverend Dr. Carrie Mitchell. And uh, you will also realize that uh, Kevin Porter also shared that uh, Dr. Mitchell will be uh, hosting a Zoom call on August 1st from 11 to 12, and we encourage you to attend that Zoom call. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, uh, Elder Lundy and Reverend Fitch, and it was great to see, I know in the Collegium, we really appreciated how COM uh, reacted to this right away and didn't sit back and analyze, but just said, okay, we need to make a statement about this and see what we can do for our churches. So. All right, I'm gonna give a leadership Collegium report before we hear from our GA commissioners. First of all, what, uh, this month is the 30th anniversary of Ruth and Kevin's ordination. 30 years ago, so we could, we could. They have a lot of stories about that when they were at seminary together, et cetera. You can uh, check with both of them for that, but please uh, congratulate them uh, later today. All right, just a few things from the Collegium and then one observation of mine. Uh, I want to mention, uh, we've got a lot on social media these days, the legacies and leadership videos highlighting the ministry stories of some iconic ministers. One iconic minister is here today, I think, but uh, and available on the Presby's YouTube channel. So please check those out. A lot going on on social media. Uh, a couple of things we, we did in our recent meeting, our group of Approved all future dates through 2025 and that you'll see those in your meeting materials. We concurred with the guide, guidelines, benefits plans, and our COM response. And please get on that link before and see Carrie's video, uh, which is extended, but will give you a, a great sense of, of the passion which which COM approached this. Uh, we went over a series of events coming up in August and throughout the fall, as your state of clerk mentioned earlier. 
One observation, I've been on a, uh, what I thought was a quest, but uh, the last church I went to, the minister said, you're on a pilgrimage. I've been on a pilgrimage over the last five years since I was COM moderator, about a week later. And they would connect individuals and families with government benefits like food assistance and health care, et cetera. As I just looked over the 14 churches I've been to in 2024, I saw, I, I totaled it up, I wrote them down each time, donations were given to 12 different food banks and community kitchens. I'm proud to say my own church just gave a major gift to Bethel for their weekly food distribution. And incredibly, three of them, and remember, the churches I visited are only one-tenth of our member churches. Somebody ought to write about this. Somebody ought to hail this uh, and recognize it. I'll do that. But <laughs> if that's only happening in food insecurity and hunger, it's happening in so many other areas as well. So you know, give yourself a hand for the collective effort of our churches. <laughs> All right, the next item on our docket is to hear the report. Now we will hear from some of the commissioners and our young adult advisory delegate to share what inspired them from their GA experience. I recognize them to present their report. So I'm the Reverend Diane Jamison Fitch. Uh, was, a was a delight to be able to go. So I just want to search, but what a joy for me, after so many years of ministry, to reconnect with so many from my past. I was united with a friend of mine from Hudson River Presbytery, friends from the Mosaics of Peace pilgrimage that I took several years ago, friends from Princeton Seminary, from Philadelphia Presbytery, and from my civil rights pilgrimage earlier this year. All of us gathered to move our church forward in faith known by name and known as a child of God. Thanks be to God. Good afternoon. Now it's afternoon. Good afternoon. The uh, young adult advisory delegates um, and the theological student advisory delegates, their voices and their passionate witness their power through leadership by making their voices heard. I saw firsthand that there are those in leadership positions who are doing good work, but also while not being at leadership positions, these were leaders who influenced others. And that was really powerful. So each time before commissioners were uh, supposed to, you know, proceeded to vote, the whose voice, voices are not heard, and how can we effectively share responsibility and power at a congregational level? How can we have this at a congregational level? In other words, whatever I witnessed at GA, how can I see that happen in my church? I also found mission advisory delegates and ecumenical advisory delegates to be valuable, such a valuable presence there. Then challenged our American rugged individualism that hasn't been the norm or logic as to small versus large church disparities. Thank you.
I'm Sharon Parker, ruling elder from Overbrook Presbyterian Church where I serve as parish care associate. And I packed that thinking into my suitcase when I went to General Assembly. Didn't take me long being there before God put my pride in its proper place. Although I was not a bold speaker, or the first to seize a microphone at General Assembly, I was a bold and determined listener. I observed. Now while through my own reactions, when perfectly decent and properly in order Presbyterians proclaimed messages that I found extremely hard to hear sitting next to the floor mic. I was often in whiplash mode as people who looked just like those in the overbook pews who confessed and professed the same liturgical word in the same way, except about fellowship hour refreshments, and that's another. <laughs> when the tall man, the strong man with braided hair came to the mic, and referenced the will of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and the spirit of the sacred buffalo, I knew I was not at Overbrook anymore. I knew. The highlight for me was the collaboration, thoughtfulness, and faithfulness during the committee meetings. I had the honor of moderating the ecumenical and interfaith partnerships committee. We had 48 people there on Zoom who are commissioners, you know, more people that I usually moderate, you know, fewer than uh, 10 uh, usually. So, so having 48 commissioners to moderate, well, it was uh, pretty challenging, I would say. Uh, but they showed love and respect towards one another as we discern together Christ's will concerning each overture. They asked good questions. They were invested in the process, even though there's 48 of them all on Zoom. They still were, they still seemed present, at least to me. And I felt that same sense of camaraderie in Christ as we moved into the plenary. Uh, and had shared meals together. There was a determination and appreciation of what we were doing and who we were with. I cannot say that I was on board with everything that was passed, especially issues surrounding the climate crisis, but I never felt any ill will against another person because we were just sh swapping stories the whole time, right? Once you start hearing people's stories, you start to a bond with one another there's something there's something that happens lastly I enjoyed getting to know the other Presbytery of Philadelphia commissioners yes being able to shop so swap stories with them and hearing what's similar and different at our churches uh, it was truly a unique and spirit enlivening uh, experience for me thank you And folks, now we'll be uh, viewing a video from our Young Adult Advisory Delegate. Once a week there every summer for over 10 years. I used to think of it as being heaven on earth. That was where I began to feel God the most. Being at GA felt like being at Griffwood again. Everyone was there with the same intention of improving the PCUSA church by spreading love, continuing faith, and living into hope. Despite how people may have voted, everyone was there for the same reason. Despite how long those meetings, I was astonished by how seriously everyone took this position. I am confident in all of these years and all the good they will do for this church. And I am inspired to continue that with them. I take what I have learned from this experience everywhere I go. 
I take all the people that I met with me, the Yads, our Philadelphia crew, and the previous and current moderators of GA, just for example. I from the assembly that will require ratification by our presbytery. I now recognize Reverend Ruth Faith Santana Grace for our executive presbyter report. My report today will be a little different. I've been asked to do an update on my reflections of the state of the church. I'm going to need your help uh, because I can't see that really well, so I'll say you slide. So I've prepared some reflections that are not in any way to be considered biblical. These are my experiential observations There's serving as co-moderator. And let me say thank you above everything else. Thank you for your encouragement, your support, your prayers. You're walking with me in Shabbat throughout the last two years. Without you, I don't know that I would have done this. And I will say, I will embrace the word I am because we are. So here is one of these, right, that we can talk to each other across time zones and worlds. And it causes a shift in our assumptions. Although many of our people are coming back to our churches, many are staying home and being church of their living rooms. So this is really caused us to have to think about what it means to be church. Sorry. Color and all kinds of other isms. Amen. So, so we've lost what we once believed we had, civility. And I say this because we in the church have to reclaim these values if we hope to be transforming agents in the world. The other one is that religious institutional identity is in decline. A million members, when the next big numbers get counted, we've been at 1.1. The bleed has stopped, but the denomination has aged such that we're dying off. And even though we're baptizing more people, like confirming more youth, we can't make up the difference. That's what happens. Aging infrastructure, which is causing our... We want to be diverse. We want to reflect God's creation. But we still struggle with what that means. We're not very successful of reaching and growing churches and are not of the dominant culture. Then we still have a denominational model that's based on a church model that no longer exists. And meeting briefly with Pope Francis, who said in our brief exchange, pray for me, not against me. Hear those words loudly. But there he was, it was like four days before Palm Sunday. It, it was his 13th anniversary of his papacy. He's in his 80s, he's frail of health, and he is to treat us into a malaise that tempts us into inactivity, complacency, blaming. We love blaming, looking for quick fixes which ultimately make our witness either irrelevant or voiceless or invisible. Next slide. So hope, living in hope, calls us to reconsider and reimagine and in order paradigm, however well-intended it is, will not be effective in evangelism and church growth. Order without order is just that. 
we can no longer, and this is hard for Presbyterians, we can no longer program our way through. We love new programs. We have a problem, we have a committee, and clearly at work. There is a great river with God's grace rolling to our nation and to the globe. So consider San Jose Presbytery, yes, it's California, but they, one of their 1,001 worshiping communities is a boat ministry serving neurodivergent adults. Folks who would ordinarily not have. So that was San Jose. They also have a brew. They're going to start brewing alcohol and non-alcohol as a gathering place for people in the community. They are trying to go where the people are in order to bring the gospel to the people. In Atlanta, a church that closed reimagines itself as a center for wealthy immigrants from Africa. I had no clue. And the energy is powerful. I went to visit. And these are partnerships. Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee, no moderator had ever been there. A Spanish language ministry offering a one-stop shopping fellowship and worship for new arrivals of Latin America. San Juan, Puerto Rico, you know, all the hurricanes that have hit the Caribbean in the last six years. Well, Presbyterian disastrously and among each other. Next slide. I love this story in Nashville, a large church spearheading a ministry that you would never see. You know how we like our ministries to be seen? This is you would never see it. They have a team of about 30 people who go out into people's homes and fix broken steps, fix broken unsafe spaces here in my tree. Their energy, their acceptance, their engagement is real. But we have to meet our youth where they are and not where we want them to be. We're seeing smaller communities of faith pop up as worshiping communities using the arts, sports, music as ways of meeting people where they live. Churches reimagining the uses of their buildings. Churches participating in creation care. Participating in Matthew 25. Next slide. This is really important to me because I believe our seminaries are a place of possibilities. And we have witnessed, as of today, six of our seminaries, or only 10, called New Generation of Leaders, recognizing that we must equip leaders for I have to say that on the international front, the resilience of a faithful people across the Sudan, Ghana, for me, the South Pacific, being in Micronesia, people who are surrounded by this beautiful water but have no potable water to drink. People who are being forced because of climate and rising sea levels, the problems, to not just be a victim to what's happening, but to think about what can they offer as an alternative. I have loved this reality of interfaith and ecumenical communities working together. Next slide. So there is hope. There is great hope. From my perspective, it was an exhilarating two years. It was also an exhausting two years. But that hope created in the image of God, this agreeing does not make us enemies. What will be our role in helping our people find a way forward that reflects the values that we do not accept? Hateful language, polarization. Can we find our countercultural voice or, we will, or will we be complicit with our silence until after these two years as we navigate the Klein and all the other messages, the theology of scarcity. But I've come 
to believe that one of our greatest evangelism and church growth strategies is being a church, a faithful embodiment of how Jesus lived. What does the community right outside our doors look like? Entity in the communities we're called to serve, that becomes the issue. Being small is not the issue. It's investing all our money in the building and not in a leadership that can help us leverage who we are called to be right now. The challenges are real, but God's hope, God's resurrection call is far greater, I believe. So thank you. I'd like to invite Brenton to lead us in this next section, which is living into hope within the bounds of this presbytery as we celebrate the recipients of this year's covenant grants. It is with joy that I come before you this afternoon on behalf of the grants review cohort to share with you Wave 1 Covenant Grant Fund Award recipients. First, some history. The Covenant Fund was established about 15 years ago following the closure of the Church of the Covenant. A story of resurrection, leadership of this presbytery at the time discerned that the income from the sale of the property would be used to establish a fund, so named the Covenants, ongoing and new. Spirit led by our congregations and worshiping communities in the Presbytery. Over the past 10 years, we have had the incredible privilege of funding initiatives close to the tune of $1 million. These dollars are yours. Let me say that again. These dollars do not belong to a commission, but to you, the Presbytery of Philadelphia. These dollars are stewarded on your behalf by the Leadership Collegium Review Cohort. May lie ahead for them and how to best award around $100,000 of grants each year. I'm excited about the possibilities for ministry we share among the applications that we receive. God is definitely at work in our presbytery. So without further delay, I now invite up our recipients to come forward as I name them and their ministries. Our first one is uh, the Beacon Church. I invite them forward. Megan. <laughs> more members of the community as they expand it. The next is Fox Chase. I'm Reverend Timothy Watchering for the installation of an oven to help uh, and stove to enable their expansion of their senior luncheon program to be able to do more things and more simply in their space. We invite Oxford and Hattie King. Big crowd up expand an already present ministry geared towards newly arriving refugees as they take on more of the leadership in that program to house newly arriving refugees in Delaware County. And then last but not least, Valley Forge with Kathy Knoble and Mike Henry. He's, he's, and for them as they, the installation of three additional cooling units and shopping carts to help the Upper Marion Area Community come to hear about these wonderful churches and grantees today. Let's keep in mind the Covenant Fund not only sparks uh, new initiatives and collaborative ministries, but also benefits the communities surrounding these churches. Uh, all these programs will address concrete needs and empower leaders. Our Covenant Fund grantees today provide just such a renewing and transforming programming as our, all of our speakers talked about today with proposals on literacy, a feeding program for seniors. Feel free to reach out to me at the office. Uh, um, and also, just to remind you, the applications are due soon, uh, August 2nd. And then awards will be determined by the end of the month. So please see the Pressway website for more information and reach out to me with any questions. Uh, with that, thank you and thank all of you.
Thank you, Ruth, and for Brenton, for those good news stories from around the world and here in our Presbytery that offer all of us concrete reasons to live into hope. I now will ask our stated clerk if there is any new business. Uh, yes, moderator, there is. Actually, there was uh, something that was brought to my attention uh, about an action that was uh, shown in the Leadership Collegium report regarding how, men how members of the Committee on Nominations are chosen. PA commissioners and others so we can walk in your ways. Yet, as we always hear and know, we continue to hear the challenges ahead of pivoting to that transforming church. Those challenges remain real, and we must continually renew our minds and our programming in such a new world. Gracious God, open our hearts so we may recognize your call and go where you might lead us. Both in our city and nation, we wonder, when will it be enough? We pray you'll forgive our and the ability to be here due to the graciousness and hospitality of the saints of Oxford Presbyterian Church. Today, we will enjoy these blessings at your hand. Amen. Amen. Okay, there's that. Yeah. So.